In earlier videos, I used custom binary files containing vertex data that I exported from Blender. In this video, I'll show you how easy it is to do this yourself. First, a few caveats. To start with, if you're hoping that this will magically get your complete Blender scene showing up in a browser window, I've got some bad news. This, this definitely won't do that. Second, in order to make this as accessible to as many people as possible, I'm actually not going to use Node for this. Node is the better choice, and you should definitely use it instead if you can, but I understand that a lot of people won't have a working Node environment, and I don't think it's worth installing and learning Node just for what we're going to do here. Instead, like everything else that we've done in this series, we'll just be using a browser. And last, I'm assuming that you have access to a local or development web server. We're going to be using the Fetch API to load our Wavefront export file, and you can't do that by just loading an HTML page straight from your file system. It's got to come over HTTP or HTTPS. If you don't have a web server, but you do have Python installed on your machine, there are a couple of single-line commands that you can use to spin up a local server, but hopefully everyone has some kind of local server that they can use. Right, so my only goal here is to show you how easy it is to build your own binary files for your 3D model vertex data. A big question you might have, though, is why not just use JSON? And sure, JSON is not a bad choice here. It's human-readable, easy to understand, and, and simple to debug. But in my opinion, it's simply not as good as binary files. Our end goal here is to have our vertex data in an array buffer to use later with WebGL's buffer data or buffer subdata methods. With a binary file, whether you're using the Fetch API or the much older XML HTTP request API, you pretty much get this array buffer for free as part of the file loading process. But getting an array buffer out of a JSON file is a multi-step, memory-intensive process. It's slow, and bloated, and in my experience it leads to dropped frames and jank when the garbage collector inevitably releases that memory when you don't want it to. But that's just my opinion. So first up, we need to export our data, and for that we'll be using the Wavefront OBJ export format. How do you create this Wavefront file? This is in Blender 3.0. If you're watching in the future and things have changed in Blender, or if you're using another modeling program, just do a quick Google search on how to export Wavefront files. But in Blender 3.0, go to File, Export, and choose Wavefront OBJ. There are a lot of customizable settings in this export window. Almost all of them are worth talking about, but there's only a few that I'll go over. First, if your Blender file contains more than one object, but you only want to export one of them, just make sure that the item that you want to export is selected and choose Selected Only. Otherwise, you'll export everything in your project. Next, under Geometry, make sure that Triangulate Faces is selected. This is super important. WebGL expects triangular geometry, while Blender works mostly in quads. Selecting this will make sure that everything comes out as a triangle. There are other ways to do this, but this is the least destructive method. Also under Geometry, we're going to make sure that we're exporting normals and texture coordinates. So right normals should be selected, and so should include UVs. And when you click Export, you should end up with two files. One is a material file, which we're not going to use, and the other is an OBJ file, which contains our vertex data. And here's what it looks like. Since I'm exporting a single object with a single material, this is the simplest form of file that you'll find. You'll notice that most of the lines here start with one or two letters, which are commands, and then a bunch of values, usually just numbers. Let's see what they're for. First, every line that starts with V, that's a vertex position. These three numbers are its X, Y, and Z components. Next, every line that starts with VT is a texture coordinate. You'll get this data because you selected Include UVs when you export it. The two numbers here are the U and V components. Next, every line that starts with VN is a normal vector. Again, you'll get this because you selected Write Normals when exporting. And the three numbers here are the vectors X, Y, and Z components. 
So we've got positions, texture coordinates, and normals. That's everything that we want for a WebGL program, right? Well, yeah, but they're all spread out. And so this is where we get to the last kind of line, the ones that start with F. F stands for face. Here you should see F and then three groups of values. So each of these represent a single vertex. A group of three, therefore, is a complete triangular face, which is what we want. It's super, super important to look for any faces with more than three groups. If you find a line with four, that's a quad. If you find a line with five or more, that's an n-gon. It's possible to write your own triangulation algorithm to handle these, but it's not worth it. Just go back and re-export this again from Blender with triangulate faces enabled. So, each of these groups contains three numbers, separated by slashes. These are each an index. The first number says which position line to use for that vertex, the second says which texture coordinate line to use, and the third says which normal line to use. Note that these index values start from 1, not 0, like we're used to in JavaScript, so, so 1 means the first line. Uh, something nice about the face line is that every one of its index values here will refer to a position, texture coordinate, or normal line above it, and never below it. So whenever you encounter a face line like this, then you have already encountered all the information that you need to process it. So you can process that line immediately. And don't worry about the index numbers resetting to 1. That should never happen in a single wavefront file. So, let's start writing that code to parse this file. Since we're using a browser window, we're going to need an HTML file and a single script. I'm using a TypeScript file here only because for, for my setup it's less messy and has better code completion, but everything that I write here is going to be pure vanilla JavaScript. Add enough code to get the page working. Make sure our code is running. Great. Let's start writing our program. I'm going to break things up here into a file loader for the wavefront file, a parser, which will build our array buffer, and a binary file writer. We're going to have lots of uh, asynchronous tasks here today, so we're going to be using async await for several functions. Okay, the file's loading fine. Next, let's put the parser in its own function, which returns an array buffer. Split up the file text body into several lines, and loop through those lines. For the lines that we're interested in, there will be a one or two letter command, and then up to three more values, never more than that. So we split each line using a space, and we'll capture only the first four items, the, the command and then the three values. Make sure we're good so far. In fact, we can destructure these values, a, a single command token, and then an array of the remaining values. So for the lines that we care about, the command will be one of v, vt, vn, or f, and the values will be an array of whatever strings come after that. And there are our values, an array of strings. Next, let's handle what happens when the command is v, a vertex position we're going to need to keep track of these values in their own array. While we're here, let's create arrays for texture coordinate and normal values. So if it's a v command, push the values into the positions array. Ah, but wait, that's an array of strings right now, and I'd really prefer them as an array of numbers. We're going to be doing this a lot, so let's break that out into its own function, something that will convert an array of strings into an array of floats. And that works. Now do the same thing for texture coordinates and normals. Last, we have to handle the face values, and these have to be handled completely differently. Again, here's what our values look like. Let's loop through those strings and get numbers we can work with. Great. What's next? 
Let's just remind ourselves of what we're trying to achieve. The array buffer that we're going to create here is going to be used later as a WebGL vertex buffer. But what data is in that vertex buffer? Well, that's up to us, but maybe a vertex position, and then a normal, and then a texture coordinate. That's the first vertex done. Then another position, another normal, and another texture coordinate. That's the second vertex. And then another position, another normal, and another texture coordinate. That's the third vertex, and that's enough to draw the first triangle. And so it goes again and again and again until all the triangles have finished. So in other words, it will be position, texture coordinate, and normal values in one long chain. That's what we need to build here. We're going to need an array to store our values. Again, a plain old JavaScript array will do. So first, let's push in our position x, y, z values. The wavefront index is one base, so we need to subtract one to get the correct index. And do the same thing for texture coordinate and normal data. And let's see what we made. We're expecting an array of numbers, but we made an array of arrays. Add a spread operator, and we're good. An array of numbers. Now, I should point out that if you did want to use JSON instead of a binary file, you could just stop here and use this data in your JSON file. But for our binary file, let's just continue. Last, we create our typed array, a float32 array, using our array buffer source array, and we're returning its buffer. And now we're done. Finally, it's time to save out this file. What I'm about to do here is what I call a stupid net trick. It's how you can save files dynamically from a browser window without any user interaction. It's a weird little hack, and for me, it's a bit of a security vulnerability, so I'd be really hesitant to use this in public-facing code, but since we're doing this on our development machines, I don't have a problem with doing it this way. To call this function, we'll provide a file name and our array buffer. And to create the function, first we create a blob, a binary large object. It will hold our array buffer. We probably don't need the MIME type here, but I'm leaving it in in case it's necessary on some systems. It, it, it should work without it. And from the blob, we create a URL object. Now the hack. First we create an anchor element and add it to the document body. You won't see it show up anywhere because we've not added a text label to it, but it's there. Then set the MIME type, which again probably is unnecessary, and specify the download file name. Bind the URL, and then the worst idea ever, we click the link dynamically. And that's it. We're done. And when we save, we downloaded a file. So did it work? If you know what values you're expecting, you can use the OD command on Linux or Mac to see the floating point values in the file. But the easiest way to find out for sure is just to use the file in a WebGL program. So let's try that. And yeah, looks great. I mean, I added the color values here in a hard-coded texture image, so it looks the way I meant it to. But just seeing the white silhouette of your object here is a sign that things are working correctly. Okay, but wait, how exactly are you supposed to use this binary file in WebGL? Easy. First, you're going to need to load your binary file. You'll need to run this in an async function. Call await fetch with the path to your file. That will return a fetch response object when the file is ready to be read. Then call await array buffer, which will read the response body and return your binary's array buffer. Once you've got that, create a WebGL buffer object using create buffer. Bind it, and then use buffer data to populate it with your binary data. Next, tell WebGL how to unpack your array buffer. Call, call vertex attrib pointer to tell it where to find your position, normal, and texture coordinate data. You already know these values because that's how you built your binary file. And last, enable your vertex attributes. So, are we done? Well, yeah, basically. But honestly, this is really just a beginning. 
because I don't know what your individual needs are, I can't tell you all of the ways that you might want to use this technique. But I do want to really emphasize how much you can do with this. First up, this file doesn't need to include only a single object. You can put in multiple objects. Building a chess game, you could put all six unique models into a single file. The technical challenge for this is how to communicate to your WebGL program where one model ends and the next one begins. You could hard code this information, but you could also add it to the top of your binary file. I'll not go into the exact details of how to do this. If anyone wants more information, leave a comment below and maybe I'll do another video explaining it. But as a quick overview, you might just put the number of objects as the very first value in your array buffer. Then you'd have a list of the size of each object's array buffer, one for every object. And then at the end of that, you'd have your array buffers, one after the other. Or notice how in my example today that I hard-coded the colors of my burger in my WebGL application? There's no reason for that. I'm, I'm using an 8x1 RGBA byte array here. It could easily have been put into the top of my binary file. Again, not super hard. So, I don't know, you've got lots of powerful opportunities here. Remember to document your code well. It's likely that you'll return to the script often at the end of your project, so make it easy for your future self to know how everything works. You can play around with the code that I wrote here by visiting this series GitHub repo, and leave a comment below and let me know what you created. I hope this helps.